my podcast, Trade Secrets. And today I have the multifaceted jewel, <laughs> dimensional jewel, uh, Lenise Bent. Hi, Lenise. How you doing? Oh, God. Hi, Candace. I'm so good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so happy to be here. Oh, I'm happy to be anywhere. You know yeah, what I mean? Well, well that too. That too. Um, uh, but just, you know, it's... Such a treat to spend some time with you, uh -huh. and thank you for having me. Oh, dude, I've been so happy to have you. And uh, don't have nearly enough women on here trying to get more and more of that, and we'll talk about that when we're talking about Lenise's uh, life. But always what I do in this, it's pretty unscripted, and what I'm trying to do is shine a light on the people behind the glass and all aspects of music, uh, engineers, producers, artists, contractors, you know, everybody that helps contribute to the village that is our community. But uh, I, I really just asked one question, and I'll, I'll start out with it now. Where were you born? I was born in Huntington Park, California, right next to Compton, where I was raised. So I'm from Compton, California. I'm a homie. Yeah, that's right. You're a home girl. Very proud of it. Yeah, indeed, you should be. Um, so I know we're, we're, uh, we're in Studio One at East West Studios, and we'll talk a lot about, we'll start Earl and go from her childhood forward, but we'll talk about Lenise's history in this building. Uh, this is East West Studios now. It was originally Western Recorders, then it became Ocean Way, then it became Cello, where I came in in the late 90s at, at this building, and I have the, the great blessing and good fortune to run this incredible studio. So that's why, that's why we're in Studio One. Okay, because we can be. <laughs> yes, and That's the so thing. grateful that you're here and to Doug Rogers and everybody yeah. who's just made this an amazing sound palace and carried on the tradition. We're still doing you know. it. We're still doing it. So you're born in Compton. Mm -hmm. uh, did you go to public high school? I mean, let's start with grammar school. Did you go to public elementary school? School, yes, yes. And in, uh, in fact, uh, the Compton Unified School District had big impact on how I moved forward even in my career later because uh, they had an amazing music program and arts program. I'm hearing and, this a lot, which is great. Yes, and um, so at the age of eight years old, I was already uh, auditioning for the school uh, orchestra. You weren't precocious. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, I was among many other kids. What did you play? Uh, I played the flute. Oh, nice. Yes. I, I skipped over one thing. I, I, I generally ask, like, what did your dad do? I'm sorry, what? What did your dad do for a living? Oh, my dad, he was an educator, uh, and he, for uh, Northrop University, oh. it started out at Northrop Aeronautical Institute, okay. and he wrote all the textbooks, and the, um, his school was a, a trade school to train mechanics to work on aerospace. Oh, cool. My dad worked for Lockheed. Yeah, yeah. so he trained all these people who repaired B-52s and Amazing. 27s. And and then he wrote all the textbooks for it, too. So he was also a technical writer. And, oh, that's very um, cool. Yeah, so... What did your mom do? My mother, um, well, she started out... She was uh, a mom. <laughs> as a mom. But uh, she was also a really good singer. Oh, and, wow. Um, and so is my aunt, and um, for a little tiny bit, they sang on the radio at a Cliffy Stone's Town Hall Party. What was it called? What was it called? Cliffy Stone's Town Hall Party from Compton, California. Nice. And some of you older people are into, uh, you know, the 50s rockabilly and country. Swing or whatever. Uh, Compton had quite a creative vortex so that was a big show i mean little brenda lee was on there and the Collins Dude, brenda twins lee. and all those people so my mom and my aunt were the wilson sisters for about this long and uh, but then um she raised uh six kids oh my god and that's a full-time uh, gig then went to work uh at uh in aerospace as well Oh, wow. Good. God bless. God bless. That's kind of what people did in Southern California. Yeah, hopefully hopefully more of that coming back to us as well. I'm hoping to have more aerospace, more tech coming back to California. Um, we'll see what happens with that. But anyway, so I live in the house that was the show house mm -hmm. for uh, the Skunk Works when they built that in Burbank. So the, all the workers that worked there, mm -hmm. that's what my house is. My it was built in 1940, that right. whole my, subdivision. My my aunt worked at uh, Lockheed in yeah, the yeah. mailroom. She's 18 years old. I wonder if she knew my dad. Yeah, she my dad worked there for Kansas. 40 years. Yeah. Uh, and, and coincidentally, my husband Brian, his dad worked for Lockheed too. We're 3,000 miles apart, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. my dad was subcontracted to the Navy because he 
built the safety systems for nuclear missiles on nuclear submarines. Whoa. Yeah, not a slouch. Wow. But yeah, yeah. But you, you know, it's not about me. It's about you. So um, Compton Unified School District, elementary school, you're in the choir, or you were in the orchestra. Uh, yes, not only did they have band and orchestra in the individual elementary schools, they also had um, the Compton Festival Orchestra, which was um, chosen kids who were good enough to um, from all the other elementary schools. And so on Saturday- Did you compete against each other to get that spot? Well, we had to audition, yeah. and they chose us, and there were nine flautists in the, uh, yeah. And um, I've known you for years. I never knew you played yeah, the flute. Yeah, I have, I have this great picture I have to show you. You'll, and yeah. I've never shown anybody, so I've, I've got to post that sometime. Um, but uh, we would uh, compete against other school systems, and we always got blue ribbons, and we made records. Oh, I love it. Yes, I have the vinyl. Were from, they wire recording? So were they no, reel to reel? No, they were real, uh, you know, blue or red or, you know, uh, yellow. But no, each but, year, but the they were an actual record. Right, but did, wow. how did they record it? Did they record it on reel to reel or like a... Did, you know, I was that's performing at the time. So you don't... So I, I don't <laughs> know. I did not notice the recording equipment. That's a very good question. Did... Uh, any of your siblings play an instrument? Uh, they play trumpet. My brother Richard, my brother Danny, and they were also, they were first chair They trumpets. both play trumpet? They both play trumpet. They, um, my brother Danny's uh, seven years older than I am, and so um, uh, he was in festival orchestra first. Cool. So that's why we were inspired to do it, and then my brother uh, Richard, Ricky at the time, uh, became first chair trumpet as well. Is your maiden name Bent? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, Bent through and through. <laughs> Bent but not broken. Dan yeah, nice. Yes. <laughs> yes, indeed. So we've got, we got Danny Bent. we mm. got Lanise Bent. Did you say Ricky, the other Richard brother? Bent. Oh, Richard? Richard Bent. I have a brother named Richard. Uh, well, cool. So how old are you guys when this is all happening? Uh, well, um, you got I know into he's seven festival years older, orchestra but... at, at uh, you auditioned at nine. Oh. And then we were in the pressure. For, um, <laughs> uh, fourth, fifth, and sixth grade. Oh, how fun. Yeah. Did you... Um, now, I don't know how it was for you here, but did you did you go to junior high in seventh grade or did you stay in the same school? Well, interestingly enough, uh, if I stayed in Compton, we moved from Compton. They waited for me to graduate from the sixth grade. Okay. Elementary school. Yes, okay. And then we moved to the South Bay area, um, specifically Torrance. Beautiful. Yeah, and um, uh, that school system uh, went from uh, kindergarten to eighth grade, oh, and then you started high school in ninth grade right. through, you know, twelfth grade. So you joined, you went there in seventh grade, and you were a new kid with As kids who'd been kid. going to school together for years. Yeah. And, oh, that's pain. That's well, rough. actually, it was kind of a new uh, area. We had a brand new tract home. We were the first people in our section of the tract home. I mean, oh, nice. Well, it was very lonely. Subdivision. Uh, it, it was a very lonely um, summer. Uh, no friends, no... Uh, Dude, but you couldn't go out. Like when we were kids, you get on your bike and leave at dawn and come back no at night. There was no place to go. The, the houses were just being built. And Come on, tadpoles, nothing, no there, water, there no was, creeks. There was, uh, yeah, we'd get on our bike sort of, but it was like no place to go. So you know where I went? I went down into our playroom because we had one because this house was, you know, tri-level, tri big oh, old, nice. you know, tracked home. Well, well six we, kids, you need a big house. Yes. <laughs> finally, my dad was able to, you know, afford one. God bless. Yeah. From his book writing, actually. And um, so we moved into this, this uh, tract with, you know, no fences, no grass, no... It was just sand blowing everywhere. Oh, shit. Uh, yeah, and I was California never land development. <laughs> yeah, I had never moved. You know, I was always in Compton, and that community was so tight, and the music, and oh, you missed so your many friends. things. And I came to Torrance. There was nothing. And in the school system, there was nothing. Oh, shit. There was no, uh, no music program. program. No, and yeah. So... I was devastated by that. Did but someone that change summer, that? The summer to keep me, you know, 
saying occupied i well we had this big old upright piano down in the playroom and i just sat down there and played and played and played all my because i studied piano in um compton as well with um olga ebersole just oh, wonderful cool. teacher and um so when we moved away i had all of this the classical training and so I just played I would just go through my whole repertoire of, of classical sheet music and Amazing. books and everything all day long because I had just yep. nothing that kept me sane grounded yeah. and I felt safe there yeah because yeah. I didn't feel safe I had no no connection to anything well I'm there. sure I'm sure that remedied itself pretty quickly but you know it doesn't I've known you for a long time and didn't really realize that you had that training in piano in class but it doesn't surprise me <laughs> because most of the people uh, that I've talked to uh, who get into engineering or get into this side of things behind the glass almost every one of them has a musical background and thank God Mm -hmm. Thank God for it, because you and I both know it can only help. Oh, my gosh. You know yeah, I mean? well, you learn the language. I mean, music theory, uh, if you learn anything about music, learn basic music theory so you can communicate. That's yeah. a, that's a um, you know, the Big international part of the skill. language. Yeah, for and, sure. Um, and that can only help you move forward if you understand what they're talking about exactly that can't, can't hurt and understand where the music's supposed to go and and all of that so that was that had a huge impact on on my successes and and my ability to move forward and the different areas i got to go into after um my making records part i went into post-production yeah, yeah we're, and we'll get to that but, we'll get to all of that yeah uh, also, did you ever play in a band Oh, as no, a, as a I kid. no. I in fact, I couldn't do recitals or anything. Believe it or Were not, you shy? I was painfully shy. Surprise! I was too. I could play an orchestra. Surprising to both of us yeah. as we are now. <laughs> we're, we're not shy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I guess we're making up for lost yeah, time or yeah. something. But um, orchestra, I felt safe, and you weren't. You weren't. You um, could hide. Yeah, yeah. Well, you were in your community. You were in your tribe, and you yeah. all played together, mm -hmm. and so it was safe. It's like in choir or yeah. chorus. Yeah. Same thing. Uh, but I was never. Um, you know, a soloist. Oh, okay, I was, gotcha. and, and uh, I uh, could never um, play um, recitals or anything like that. I'd be physically ill, and I would Aww. bake my way out of it. Well, you're you're a beautiful woman now, and I'm oh, sure you well, were a gorgeous young girl. Was, so you're 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 playing piano in the in the playroom, and yeah. then you, and then you start, you know, uh, seventh grade. I'm sure you made friends quickly. Did you? It was it was awkward because uh, it's well, tough being the new kid. I've had to do that. Yeah, I I would like to go back a little bit back to Compton. Sure. Another thing that Compton provided for us being close to Hollywood, um, my parents wonderfully, thankfully, uh, signed my brother Richard and I up for Richard and me rather uh, uh, for the um, Screen Children's Guild. What is that? That yes, that was. Um, uh, an agency where they would Did they exploit child actors yes <laughs> child, yes we were child yes but uh, not exploited no it was like cue the kids you know whenever they needed oh. children in a commercial or um you know a tv series or in a movie my brother's very first gig was in hitchcock's the birds oh wow yeah yeah he was eight years old what a great film yeah so if you blink you miss him but he's in the birthday party scene he's the one who dives under the table now, was that was that filmed uh was that filmed in Northern California? Was that filmed that by was the filmed at Universal? It was. As, I wondered. As well as uh, Bodega Bay. Oh, that's what I meant. Bodega both Bay. both places. But my mother, yeah. who um, oddly enough, uh, ironically enough, had this enormous phobia to birds all her life. Tried everything to get over it. She was attacked as a baby oh, okay. and by a mother hen. Oh. And her her mom in Kansas was showing her the new baby chicks and the oh, mother and hen. Her came out and oh because she got too close to the baby yeah 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 and uh yeah. but my and so we're guessing that's what caused it but she was you couldn't have birds around you know we couldn't Aww. do picnics we couldn't go camping and, and the birds knew it 
So they, <laughs> they fuck with her. There she yeah. is, and you know her energy. Dude, that's so crazy, they, right? They would dive bomb her. They would, and she was terrified. So, Dude, of course, is... what's the first job that she has to be stage mom for? Is, is the, on the birds? Set of the oh birds. my god! You and she said, make "I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this." And and a lot of those birds, believe it or not, were mechanical. Oh um, wow! Yeah, I did and, not... and every. So if you know, so she look, wasn't too scared. Yeah. See, this is this is one of the this is the other side of the double-edged sword about being in the film business as a kid, is that you, you get to see behind the mirror all the time, and we're no fun. Even as kids, we weren't any fun to watch TV with or watch movies with. Because you're go, like, oh, that's Look fake. It. Her purse is on the other shoulder. <laughs> Look at, you know. Or the boom, uh, yeah. the boom is hanging down yeah, in the shot. <laughs> yeah, or yeah, you're always and, and noticing stuff. And people would say, would you just be quiet? You're ruining it for me. And be like, and not about that. But Lisa Richard and I had fun doing that together. So how fun? So 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 he did the birds. What were some of the things you did with the? Was uh, it the actually, Children's Screen Guild? What'd you call it? Uh, the um, Screen Children's Guild. Okay, cool. It was right, um, the offices were right down on Sunset. You know, you see that building that has kind of that roundy ramp. It's across from the old um, Island Records. I know Records. what it is. That, yeah, that, that was a publishing. That's where the offices were. Oh, that became a Peterson Publishing building. Yeah, so. Right, right before Crescent Heights. Yeah, so. Um, is that what you're talking about, that building? Yeah, it's on, the, ramp the, on the south side sides. of the street. Yeah. And that's where the Screen Children's Guild. So oh, okay. we'd have to go in once a month, and they had to make sure we didn't bite our fingernails. And we had, you know, they looked at your teeth. My teeth were... Um, very spaced out Your at the time uh, to where a, a future boyfriend once said that you had a gap like my tongue was in jail. Oh my God, that's <laughs> fun. <laughs> yeah, this, we're not PG, okay? It, yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah we will yeah, so we he would, That was his joke about me in the seventh grade. And, oh. Um, anyway, oh. And, but it kind of was true. Um, you know, I Did had you have a, a nickname? I had, you know, my name being Candace, people call me Candy, but they would uh, randomly, uh, my nickname was Ace because my name is spelled C A N D A C E. Oh, right. People right. were just too lazy <laughs> to Actually, say my that, name. You know, I like that. Did you like that? I didn't mind it. Yeah. I mean, Ace because is a positive. Ace is yeah, like, right. You know. Did you have I, a nickname? What was your, um, I've never asked this question before, by the way. <laughs> uh, I don't think. I, when Nisi. my mom was mad at me, oh, okay. or when they were mad, they go, Lenny D, because my name's Lenise Diane. Oh. And so, okay. uh, so I knew. You know, did people call you niece or Lenny or was it? Um, they only a few people could I call, call you me niece sometimes. Yeah, I don't know well, why. you see, you can get away with it. Most, um, most people just call me Lenise, and even back then it, it was Lenise because unless I was in trouble, it's a beautiful and unusual name, Lenise. Uh, well, it's a thank pretty you. name, thank yeah. you. It's, um, there's only a few of us around, I don't know anyone else, with yeah, me. well, uh. Oddly enough, when I I lived down in the Caribbean for a while, yeah, we're gonna get. I, I want to hear that part too. There were three Lenises that is on the crazy. island. Gorgeous West Indian women spelled the same way as me. Who uh, knew? And it was like my tribe. I found my tribe. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, we keep finding but, our tribe. So, so the Compton and that transition from Compton to Torrance was tough. And, yeah. you, and you're in seventh grade now, which again, you do seven and eight in that school. And then you'd move on to ninth grade in high school. Did you go to Torrance High? I went to Torrance High. I have one one other no, thing can... that was um, uh, the summer of the sixth grade or the uh, um, spring break of sixth grade. Uh, I was running across the street trying to get past a car, and I slipped and fell. Oh shit! And the car hit me. Oh crap! Yeah, and. Uh, then so he's I, got hit by a car. I did. What First the hell? First day of, of uh, Easter vacation. Oh, Yeah, mama. and I was flown across the street. Fortunately, um... Well, you look okay. Well, <laughs> it was, you know, I didn't walk for a little bit, but, um, um, everything came okay, except so I had a leg. traumatic growth spurt, and it hit my, you know, it, it rattled my hypothalamus and my... So I grew three inches in three months. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, not, not attractive. I, do fi I grew five inches the year of sixth grade yeah. from 5'3 to 5'9 over well, the course well, this, of that year. I, from sixth grade, I was 4'11, and beginning of seventh grade, I was 5'2, just 
arms and stick. legs. Yeah, we and were no all stick clothes figures. Fit. There were no clothes. You got new clothes, though. See, this is the cool part. The hand-me-downs didn't work anymore, and I got to get new clothes. Well, see, I'm, Right? You know, that was really a strategy. Well, there were no <laughs> clothes that fit me yeah. because I was so gangly. Now... Uh, now, you know, things are different. But back then, you know, you went to the we're Broadway We're curvy store. gals. We're curvy gals. Now. S sorry? We're curvy gals yes, now. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so it's different now. But uh, And my hands and feet were pretty much the size they are now. So, and, <laughs> and my teeth were, my tongue was in jail. Dude, you're just a whole picture of goodness right yeah, there. Yeah, right? Dude, yeah, it was dude, pretty, yeah, you know, uh, this puberty is, was not my friend. Okay, this is the good news, though. <laughs> This is the good news. A, you're beautiful now, but this is the good news. I, I have a theory, and, and see if you agree with me on this. Uh, I went back to my, and this is years ago, I went back to my 20th high school reunion. And when I was in high school, I don't look that different. I mean, I'm certainly much older. But when I went to my 20th high school reunion, you know, in high school, I had long, frizzy hair. I had braces for five years, metal braces. I wore glasses. I've worn glasses since I was five, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I wore so, you glasses know, since so I was you're, eight. You're, yeah. I'm five, so I had that, I forgot. Dude, I'm 5'9". I weigh like 100 pounds. You know, I look like fucking olive oil, right? Tall and skinny, and you're skinny too, you know? But I have a theory, because like I said, when I went back to 20th High School Reunion, the girls that were geeky and gawky, we all looked all right 20 years later, I'm saying. And the girls that were real pretty, some of them were still real pretty, but most of them got fat. And the football player dudes who were hunky, mm -hmm. they got real big, you know. Mm -hmm. And the skinny, dorky guys, they were hot now, too. Yeah. See what I'm saying? So don't don't rule out the dork, okay? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or the yeah, nerd. Especially in high school when you're a dweeb yeah. or, an, or, you know, seventh and eighth grade. Yeah. Uh, I was. The puberty's rough, I was man. very dweeby. <laughs> Yeah. And and uh, and trying to fit in, and of course my hair with puberty. Uh, oh, I yeah. had kind of wavy hair before. Oh yeah, mine's nuts. No, it went. It did this. Yeah. And and this is. I moved to the South Bay where you go to the beach every day. Yeah, and so humidity surf and surfing, and and you had to have that straight blonde hair with oh, yeah. a little ribbon. We both hair. share that surfing uh, Caribbean uh, experience, both of us. We've never really talked about it too much. We'll talk about it. A little bit for you today, yeah. but I'll show you more of mine later. Yeah. But uh, but so yeah, you're you're. It's a tough time, you know. It was, yeah. So <laughs> and it doesn't change though. All you oh, and young you start girls, to grow here too. Oh, I didn't. No? I didn't know that was the other joke that were you flat as a pancake till I was late twenties. Flat as a pancake. Uh, to, well, you know, puberty was still a rumor to me. That's what <laughs> that's what that same boyfriend said. Oh yeah. 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 Screw that guy. Okay. Yeah. Well, it, actually, it was. True, and it was funny. And, uh, uh, and, and he and I are really good friends. And, oh, that we yeah, love that. Yeah, yeah fortunately. I've, uh, yeah, I had, a, I had to think I had a boyfriend. In for, I was always chasing the boys, you know, ch chasing them. Yeah, had, I'm happily married, but it hasn't changed. So, you know, Nader, yeah. our videographer, I'm probably going to chase yeah. him later. You know what yeah. I mean? Run around. <laughs> he's awesome. He's gorgeous. And Keith, our recordist, he's the best, too. So we're in Studio One, like I said, at East West. And uh, we're, gonna, we're not going to jump from seventh grade to Lanise's career. We're going we're gonna to go. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to go through high school. So, so uh, you, you obviously ended up acclimating to Torrance. Well, what choice did to. you have? Yeah. I had to. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. Um, and, and, um, did you uh, find your, your people? Did you find other music I people? I did. Uh, yes. And um, uh, wonderfully enough, uh, I'm still friends with them. We reconnected in our later life. Oh, in cool. fact, just... Two Sundays ago, we had a, a girl swim party that we do, but one of my friends lives up in Palos Verdes with this wonderful backyard oasis, and we just come and bring wine and something to eat and, How awesome. and float in the pool, and we do this a few times a year, and these are ele Hickory School elementary um, friends. Oh, I love Still, it. Still, yeah. I love it. Not if, before high school. Right, right, right. Well, we're, we are going to jump to high school. So uh, I'm sure there was a lot going on in seventh and eighth grade. Well, and one important thing, too, was that's when you have your aptitude tests. Yes. And uh, I always saw myself as an artist. I was always painting or drawing or um, creating Did things. they say math? Uh, engineering. <laughs> Interesting. And See, everybody laughed at me. It doesn't surprise Because me. back then... That was not what girls did. Yeah. And I was shocked when I saw that I had this aptitude for engineering and I was devastated and embarrassed and 
I wanted to be this this um, grand, you artist. know, this wonderful artist and creative and free spirit. Do you and draw as well? I yeah yeah. yeah. I, this is. I'm not. I oddly enough, I'm not. I'm not creative. Well, the, at all. I started like in kindergarten. I would never. You know, they want you to play house and school and all that. And I just, ugh. no, I just wanted to paint, you know, and, and make clay things and, and all of that. I never, never played house. I never wanted, you know, Dude, I come, dolls, none of that stuff. I come from this family where they all play an instrument. My three brothers, mm -hmm. who you know, a guitar, bass, you know, they became wonderful engineers. My brother David's a photographer. My mom was a painter. Her home. Mm -hmm. did, she did yes, commercial Yes, my mother art. was a wonderful artist as yeah, well. Yeah, my mom did commercial. Plain air, watercolors. Oh, I love oh, that. Planet. That's outside, if those of you who don't know what plein air is, is you set up an easel outside and you do a landscape outside. Yeah, uh, and it's uh, typically it's, it's watercolors. Watercolor, which, which is, is really very hard. unforgiving. Yeah, very you, hard. You can't fix it. You, you, know, been, you just have to run with whatever it does. I've been dabbling in watercolor and, uh, and photography just for a, a personal outlet, which I really mm -hmm. enjoy. But um, point being that you had this trauma where you thought you were, were yes. going to show up as an artist and you showed up more on the, on, is that yeah. right brain, the, the math side, well, of the engineering um, side? Actually, it was, uh, I'm, it's, I was reverse. I, I was kind of both and I yeah, still yeah. kind of am both. Yeah. Um, mine was, mine was heavy, heavy, heavy on, on English, uh, on, uh, on English, on stuff like that, yes. on, on comprehension, reading comprehension, English, stuff like that. I wasn't, uh, I didn't do that well in math. I mean, I did okay, but. And you now I ended up doing this. Well, that's whatever. We'll figure that out later. Well, we had, <laughs> uh, fortunately, my father was adamant that uh, we have a good education. God bless. And my, even, my parents And did. so at dinner time, like on Discussions. Tuesdays, Tuesdays uh, Tuesday nights was like Spanish night. Nice. And you have to hold up tienador, you know, for your fork. And you, he'd, he would give us certain words and that we would have to use within the dinner time. Oh, I love that. Yeah. And then, of course, my brother Richard would always ask my dad, what part of the cow did this come from, you know, on, the, on our dinner? And, yeah. of course, my mother, who, you know, was a, a closet vegetarian, I would have to go ah, and leave the table and, and we'd have this... Um, uh, anatomy and physiology. Oh yeah, um, yeah. You don't want to talk about how the cow got on the to table me, too. <laughs> yeah. But uh, we also got read to a lot. Yeah. And and until we were reading and ourselves and um, uh, literature was big. Yeah. Our and proper was English was big. Yes. And um, my parents were intellectuals. We didn't. We didn't. TV time was very limited. TV, mm -hmm. not in any kind of a harsh way or, or dictatorial way, but they just look down on it, you know? And so because you want to please your parents, you become erudite and you become well-read because you want to be able to talk at the well, dinner table and discuss the things that you're talking about. That's if you're a pleaser. I, I, I was a pleaser. I, was, I wasn't a pleaser. Oh, okay. Um, but you're still erudite and well-spoken <laughs> well, and intelligent. Uh, I, um, well, I do love reading. Yeah, me I too. I do love reading. Uh, you know, literature, mm. and, you know, you find an, uh, you know, a, a, an author, and you just read oh, all their same. books, and, you know. Now, were you ever in a school play? No, God, no. Oh, oh look at this. No, I was terrified of acting uh, on that level. I pursued it in college, and I sucked, but yeah. uh, I took a lot of drama classes, and I got, and in high school, I'd, I'd get the good part, you know, like uh, was uh, I think it was Barefoot in the Park, but then this girl, Catherine Underwood, if you're listening to this, in Virginia Beach, when I went to high school in Virginia Beach for a minute, or junior high, and uh, I, I got the part, and then she auditioned, and I became the understudy. After I already had the part, I was so butthurt. <laughs> but I think it happens but, a lot to but, people. I think because know. she was blonde, she had the, uh, the you know, the uh, Jane Fonda. More of the Jane Fonda vibe, you know, that they were going for for Barefoot in the Park for that for that production in in high school, but uh, so you found you kind of found your people, you know. Uh, well, the, a point, one of the things I wanted to mention about that engineering aptitude thing oh, yeah. was uh, there was no support back then. Nobody, uh, you know, said good for you. Wow, you know, take these courses or or you can get into, you know, automobile design or you can get into, you know, you know all these other areas. There was, I just got laughed at. Oh, really? That's know? weird. And uh, because 
girls didn't do engineering. Dude, surprisingly enough, I grew up in the South and it was not like that. Well, it was it the was, opposite. Well, here, you Mechanics, know. Mechanics, all kinds of well, stuff. Well, I guess because all, all of the South Bay was all about Surfing. aerospace. And, oh, right. And either you... Your mom was a secretary. Okay, yeah. Or, and your dad was an aerospace engineer, and you didn't know what that meant. Um, all I know is that uh, when we were on the set, when we would get gigs in Compton, because I quit the Screen Children's Guild when we moved, and um, uh, I was fascinated by what went on on set. And so behind the camera and the technology and what they were doing and... Um, were there women working be, on those sets? No. That's, no. So, that's so weird well, to me. Back, no, it was just, you know, TV shows, westerns. Right. Um, you know, I, I worked on one show. Uh, these were a lot of... There was a psychological thriller, and I was... A, uh, um, I played a, a challenged kid with disabilities oh, that Jesus. they sent a busload of us to a women's prison oh, so the women could this is the story of the show right, right. and and i had to like drool on the and, bus. oh good god and, and, <laughs> and uh yeah i did good i did good yeah yeah um but uh we're both you know, natural but i but between takes i would be right there with the cameraman, right there with the sound man, and, and I'd be going, wow, this is great, and watching everything, and then they'd say, okay, cue the kids. i go, oh, shoot, I gotta go back. Can, can I come back? And they go, yeah, you're, you can come back. And so th that uh, really fired up my, um, you know, engineering, I yeah. guess. Well, that, that, part curiosity, of my brain. that curiosity for how they get things done and how it works behind the scenes, yeah. that doesn't surprise me at all. We're both pretty natural feminist i think it's part of the time we grew well, up it, to me it's genderless i, I think agree. anybody who wants to do anything like that can I, anybody know? can do anything and other can, than be a blind bus driver you know what i mean <laughs> or a blind pilot yeah, yeah i mean there's other know, things you can do if you're blind yeah, but yeah. uh so don't let your it, don't it, let things limit you well pursue what you when you're pursue. nine and ten years old you're just you're still it's such a time of discovery and to, probably to have it be in that environment was so wonderful and uh it stimulated both my brother and i went into um television and film production and um until i found out one day how records were made yeah and that whew, we're gonna get there but man it sounds like it sounds everything. like though even though you didn't feel the support in school or whatever it sounds like you had it from your parents it sounds like your well, dad I did. my dad was yeah. well he was kind of oblivious to you know those sort of things um uh he was he was quite an intellectual i was gonna say and, so but he wouldn't so have stopped he wasn't warm it. and fuzzy but he wouldn't have stopped it no not yeah, at yeah, all yeah, yeah. not at all um uh, he just, he had so much going on. It, I didn't get a lot of attention as well, a kid. Well, six kids, come on. Well, and, by, and I'm the youngest. If you go to three classes in the morning, you can go to college in the afternoon. And I went, yes, okay, I I'll, I'll do it. And I almost went every day to high school, day. At, at those three classes, but I always went to El Camino Junior College uh, in the afternoon which worked out great because uh, my mom worked at Garrett Air Research, not far from there, so I could take the Mustang. Nice. And, uh, uh, my dad would drive. Dude, her beautiful to girl in a Mustang. I yes. see trouble. I could cruise the high school in in our Mustang, Burgundy Mustang, with the. It had the the pony interior. Oh yeah, dude. Yeah. It was like a '67, '68. It nice. was a '66. It was no, my mom's. No, nice. Yeah. And uh, so I got to, that's how I learned to drive on that car. And, uh, and I learned how to drive a stick on my brother Danny's GTO. Nice. Yeah, bless his heart, you know. Dude, my that, father that, gave I, me a He six let me, you know, almost drop his carburetors with Dude, whatever. My, my father gave me a 67 Nova in high school, and I was such an asshole that I didn't appreciate it. I started driving early at 14 or 15. We had like a of Chevy Vega or something but I he gave me this Nova that was bitching right and yeah. and I was such a dumbass I was into like Citrones and weird shit and my dad was like what are you talking about I gave you this and I ended up selling that Nova that 67 Nova and I think I bought a Toyota or something stupid 
But yeah, you do stupid shit when you're a kid, okay? Part of this podcast is don't do stupid shit. No. Anyway, um, so, but I love it. So you, you, you're, and I was going to say that I skipped 11th grade because I went to high, I went to eighth grade in Virginia. We lived in Virginia Beach for a minute and they started high school in eighth grade there. So I took, mm -hmm. and really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And I you had middle school was like fifth, sixth, and seventh. I'm right. Oh. No, we had, we started know. high school. school. In, we started high school in eighth grade. And uh, in Virginia, they started with the credits. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if they still do, but you had to have more credits to graduate in Virginia than you did. not then we moved back to South Carolina. And I started ninth grade, which was high school there, was ninth grade. And I already had algebra and I already had biology and I already had English. Mm -hmm. So I already had those three. So by the time I got into 10th grade, I went to summer school at the end of 10th grade mm -hmm. and took 11th grade English skipped the 11th grade. I didn't have to go at all. So it wasn't because I was a genius. I just had the credits. So I skipped 11th grade and my senior year, I was 16. So I graduated and started college. Dude, I graduated. I started, I'm, I'm, I was a virgin. I moved out, got my own apartment, started college. My father had passed. So I had, oh Lord. Oh, that's not good. The mic just fell. Um, anywho. Very good. Um, but I got social security because my father had passed and oh, I was wow. able to, to do all those things. So you're going to El Camino College. We're similar in that way that we couldn't wait to get started with our lives. Yes. You yeah. know what I mean? And well, I just needed mental simulation. Yeah. And I wasn't getting it except one class, which I totally loved. And it was anatomy and physiology. Amazing. And it was so hard. And that was, and uh, Mr. Marakian, the instructor, uh, he let me go to first period. Um, so I, because I was signed into third period and I didn't want to hang around that long. And um, so, my dad would drop me, my friends Sharon and, and me off at early bird PE at, um, that started at like eight or seven or something. And we'd have early bird PE and then I'd go to Mr. Merakian's anatomy and physiology class. And he said, you know, I don't care whether any of you come to class or not. I just, if you miss a day, you will not pass. And I just went, oh. <gasps> I love this. And um, oh, so I, I went every day and we, you know, we dissected a fetal pig and we. Remember the frog, <coughs> the liver did, of the frog looked like a piece of you jade. You hit the frog. Yeah, it's horrible what you did to them. <laughs> but that's how you learned, yeah. you know, how to remove a spinal cord. And um, you learned all the, you know. Uh, Is that how you learned how to remove a spinal cord? <laughs> that's a, yeah, yeah, yeah and I use it often. <laughs> that's one of those skills I'm so grateful for. <laughs> <laughs> it's so awesome <laughs> you're such a badass yeah. oh i love it but um yeah you know uh, pseudo stratified squamous epithelium i mean yeah things like that i went oh god i love that that's a part of your step yeah yeah and you know, squamous squamous cells yeah, are precancerous yeah, and pseudo stratified means that there's fake lines on it oh interesting. pseudo stratified oh there we yeah, go yeah so um new word of, of the day things, pseudo stratified <laughs> squamous epithelium <laughs> yeah um so i just i've just soaked up this class like there was no tomorrow because it was interesting it used my brain yeah. you know and good and teachers it used make that all part the... of my brain that i loved dude and good teachers make all the difference my eighth yes. grade english teacher mrs hamilton changed my life and She's he wasn't amazing. snarky about it he was he was like he was Matter enthusiastic and he was an excellent communicator and teacher, you know, Merakian. So, um, and I got it and, I, and you know, loved that. So I would go to early bird PE, take Merakian's class and then walk home. And my friend and I, we'd make macrame jewelry that we I sold, love it. Nice. you know, and, but my dad, this is how tired they were and all. We'd, we'd walk home to our house in Marvelous States in Torrance and, and we'd be sitting at the, dining table, doing all of our artwork. And my dad, like every once in a while would come in, maybe he had a doctor's appointment or something where he wasn't at Northrop University. Right. And he wouldn't even notice that we weren't supposed to be there. <laughs> yeah, you were supposed to be in school. And we're supposed to be in school. And we go, <gasps> you know, he dropped us off a few hours oh, earlier. <laughs> <laughs> and he'd walk in and he'd go into the kitchen and he'd, he'd see us and we go, 
hi, and my friend, hi, Mr. Mint, and and uh, uh, and we just we we're just going, oh no, so was, do we? You know, and and it never never occurred to, or he never said anything it, and we just kept going and, it could you have know. been trust he could have figured well maybe she got it no early. no he was his <laughs> mind was somewhere else he, was, he had a, he had other students to worry about yeah, yeah you yeah. know and so when he came home from school he he wasn't uh very participatory um in my um guidance okay and, uh, because he did that all day long yeah yeah he's people, worn out you know and so i kind of had to make my own decisions and some of them weren't so great but i did uh try three different um uh, majors in i did school too. psychology which uh i really loved until i had a screwball teacher who wasn't very nice and so that killed that but then i went into uh well i had i had blossomed a little bit and my parents thank god had sent me to the palace verde school of charm and modeling Ooh. because they were scared you know i was you were 14 gorgeous. and gorgeous. no I, I, mm, I still a little you know you're 14. you're awkward you know but um they were trying to you know get me some um you know girl charm, stuff charmin uh, yeah, yeah, charm school. So, so I would get the right manners and you know how to hold your <laughs> crazy stuff. Did you have like to walk with a pencil to... on your head? My mom made me walk with a pencil. No, well, on my head. if you were uh, at a cotillion or yeah. a, a dance or if you yeah. were at something like that, how you hold your cake and tea, yeah. you know, and and if somebody asks you to dance, you know, this you don't stand up with it. You set it down first. Yeah, and you never carry a handbag wider than your hips. That's, and, that's a rule I, yeah, well, I don't know if I was, could have a handbag and, that big yeah, now. <laughs> stuff like that, but they did teach you ballroom dancing. Yeah, yeah. And they did teach you uh, basic, um, you know, manners and things like that. But they also took photographs and they uh, got you modeling jobs, you yeah, know. Where, I modeled as a kid. So um, one of Surprising. my modeling jobs was <laughs> at the Broadway department store. And, um, but I wasn't 14. I was you know but still they would send me out on things and i was uh modeling for um uh classic wax at uh in the automotive department oh weird. and and this one saturday to dem i was demonstrating how classic wax was so hard with this carnuba wax carnuba in there wax. that you could wax the car and then boom throw the can across it and it wouldn't nick the the classic car and so they had a um, uh, a Maserati there. Nice. Yeah, at the Delamo Fashion Square. Very cool. And so I'm, you know, my little mini dress and I'm demonstrating um, classic wax and I'm throwing the can and it's doing its thing. This little guy comes up and he goes, oh, I got a car like that. And he's like, you know, in his 70s. And I said, Ooh, really? Um, I said, how'd you get that? And he goes, oh, in the stock market. And I said, really? Uh, tell me about that. And nice. um, so he said, well, you know, you just look at it every day and then you just watch what it does over a period of time and, and you uh, buy when it's going up and you sell when it starts to go down. And so basically that's it. That is and I went, I got to learn this. Oh, so I love I, it. So I dropped out of, uh, you know, changed my major to business law. And I never really had a real job yet. Oh, wow. And so I didn't know what any, you know, I took income tax accounting, which I had never filed income tax. So I, it was like Chinese, but <laughs> I've used that a whole bunch. Oh, I'm you know, sure. that was a great thing to learn. But uh, anyway, so I changed my major, realized, yeah, I'm not that girl. And then um, discovered the audio visual department, nerd, 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 at, um, uh, at El Camino Junior College. Actually, what happened was I had uh, I had a nervous breakdown. Oh no! At 19, oh, my I God. was going well. I was I was working three jobs. Yeah. And uh, I was trying to find my way and trying to please my parents. This might be you know with getting good grades in college. And one day, one night, I started hyperventilating and I couldn't stop. Oh no! And a they panic attack. took me to the yeah. They took me to the hospital, shot me full of Valium, didn't work. Uh, 
my brother Danny sat up with me all night because I was Aww. freaking out. And in the morning, God bless him, he called my jobs and said, um, Lenise won't be coming back for a while. And um, and I dropped out of school Aww. and to get well. Because it was, it was so physical. Yeah. It was like I had overheated and cracked my block. Right, yeah. And it, it feels the like analogy your electrical, with an engine with a car. electrical wiring has fizzled. And it's very physical when that happens. I just like blew a, f blew a fuse and I had to heal. And you were upset. So Aww. I took a few months off, just stayed home and uh, played piano. There you go. <laughs> no, but this is good. We're back to how music heals. Yeah, I played piano. And then when I went back to college, uh, I just took four classes and they were art appreciation, music appreciation, um, and photography nice. and audio visual. Nice. And, uh, and just in God bless my brother, Danny. He said, you know, just take stuff you like. you like. Yeah. Don't try to, you know, change the world or get out, or you career. know, graduate Don't, soon yeah. and, you know, whatever. Just do it fun. And, yeah. and it worked. And the audio visual thing led to um, multi-track recording. A, a videotape multi-track recording was done on two-inch tape back then. Yeah. With a Heliascan machine it was very much like a, a two inch audio recording machine yeah. and one of my instructors had a, a little local cable station so did you um, have things like nagra and things like that like uh well uh yes they had that but that was more for film yeah and i hadn't gotten that far yet okay and um uh so this was really good and i so i was filming uh on Wednesday nights, the the local high school uh, basketball game. That's so cool, and you're also into photography too. So this yeah, fits. so I was I was uh, you know printing and you know developing and all that. Actually, that started when I was 11 because my sister went to UCLA and she was an art major and she took photography and so she would take me out of school to have her assist her in the dark room. Nice. And on Saturdays as well. So I got to go to UCLA as a little kid and and learn in, and be in the dark room with her and learn how to do all that stuff. So that that was great, you know, having older siblings was a wonderful thing. They helped me so much. I mean, yeah. like, you know, and God bless them. Yeah, and so that's So this is where you that. get the bug. This is where you get the bug in the audio visual and you start to see how this and you already as a kid well, you it like was the emerging and stuff. it was emerging and uh, I was very much into local music and well going to concerts and all of that, you know, sneaking out at the window at fourteen and going yeah. to the bank, which was a blue law, which was a big shed and we'd see you know, I, I saw the doors. I yeah. saw uh, you know, the old Fleetwood Mac, I saw, um, you With know, Peter John Green. Mayle, May He Rest in Peace. I yeah. saw all these bands and then go to the Lovins at Griffith Park. Yeah. Because a friend had a car. And, um, but it was all about the music and also that this boyfriend, that same boyfriend who was, you know, it's making easy. those jokes about yeah. me. Um, he he meant it lovingly, and he was he was funny. He was a singer. His name is Robert Fleischman, ah. and he and I went steady from the age of twelve to twenty four with like a, a short break in there. But um, he ended up becoming the lead singer of Journey before yes. Steve Perry, yeah. and he wrote many of the songs, you know, "Wheel in the Sky" and all oh, what that. A great singer. Well, we were. You know, boyfriend or girlfriend. I was taller than he was for a while, and we had our teeth straightened together, <laughs> our retainers. And uh, uh, anyway, uh, and we're very good friends now. Very oh, close. Awesome. He lives in Wisconsin, but um, and just put out another record. Anyway, fabulous person, but he had bands, and um, his um, guitar player Roger um, had gotten a job engineering for Leon Russell. Amazing. And Leon Russell had one of the only home studios ever in the world at that time because, as you can see, it takes up a lot of real estate. It's very expensive. You got to know what you're doing. Leon was brilliant. You know, I talked to Skip Saylor recently uh, on one of these. I interviewed Skip. And Skip recently, not that long ago, well, it might have been eight years ago, 
but Leon had a studio here in California. By the way, Leon played well, in this, this room. Well, this was in California. This was in, he's yes. had a few. He had, he had a few. one right on Magnolia called yeah. Alpha. Yep. What? Well, yeah, Alpha still there, right across from Evergreen. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, but Skip was talking about going in there, and we were talking about Leon Russell and the impact he had. A lot of people don't realize that Leon Russell was part of the Wrecking Crew. Yeah, that he was the piano right player here. for Doris Day. He played on all these records. You know, yeah. short hair, good looking, early gray and blue eyes, but short hair in a suit during the time of you have the, you know, uh, Tommy Tedesco and, and, yeah. and Hal Blaine and Carol yeah. Kay yeah. and all that, that he was a yeah. pianist. Yeah, he was a great pianist um, and a musical director and producer. Dude. Well, so by, and, and I was an enormous fan. Dude, Mad of, Dog's an Englishman. Leon Russell. He had already put out that blue album, Leon. And I also had uh, uh, the Asylum Choir with Mark Benno. Yeah. Um, that was Leon and, and um, uh, a bunch of people were in that. But, uh, and the Shelter people had already come out or whatever. Yeah. Shelter and Records. So, um, so I couldn't wait to, when Roger said, oh, Lenise, I'm, you know, engineering at this studio for Leon Russell at his house. You, you should come and see it. Well, are you kidding me? I had never been in a recording studio. didn't know anything about it, but boy, did I want to meet Leon Russell. Yeah. So after school that day, because I was in, you know, El Camino Junior College, uh, I guess I was 19 and I was back, you know. Yeah, you're good. I'm, I'm good. Uh, rested and, and repaired yes. and um, uh, so I go over there and he had bought um, the house that Lou Costello used to live in who died he died in that house oh, wow. but it was a mid-century pointy thing on Woodley I, I could go right there now oh, wow, cool. and um, and I go up there and I ring the doorbell and Leon answers his own door I and I it. just I'm weak at the knees oh is a real thing. Oh yeah, and I almost passed out. I'm a huge out. fan of Leon. And but he was he was handsome. Uh, he, he was yeah. Well, his hair was a lot whiter by then. He was old. He was 34. Watch out! Watch <laughs> and, uh, out! But he said, "Oh, you must be Roger's friend." Come yeah, on that in. That accent that he oh, had. He that was, Oklahoma accent. He was such a gentleman. Accent. He was such a gentleman. Yeah, yeah. And um. So uh, I go in to this foyer that has a ball that looks very much like that light right there. <laughs> and, um, but I hear all this great music coming out from where a dining room was supposed to be. And it's a control room. And it's 21 tracks of Leon's wife, Mary McCrary, Amazing. singing. Uh -huh. and it was like the angels were singing to me. And uh, I look in. And it's brightly lit, surprisingly. And there's a Stevens 40 track tape machine. There is, I think it was a, an MCI console. A I'm Stevens not sure. 4 track or Stevens 40? 40. 40. Wow. Oh, there's only three made. And he had one of them. Interesting. Yes. He, Leon was so much more. Very technically, yes, very, yes. Very, well, and he was very into multi track Innovator. video recording. Oh, okay. He started that where he, he, uh, couldn't understand or it made sense to him you record every camera on a fader and then that you mix that way interesting yeah why not very cool yeah, yeah. so that was one of his concepts um, but he was really technically savvy and smart and had this fantastic studio and this young guy Roger uh, who is 18 who's a great guitar player and technically savvy himself um, I saw that, I heard that, I felt I had my epiphany, and that's when I, next day, dropped out of university, found a recording school, and went home and told my parents. I love and, it. And, you know, uh, thankfully my dad gave me his blessing. I love it. Well, one of the things, and I, and I want to focus on here that I always talk about in the podcast is I'm always trying to shine a light on the people behind the glass, you know, we, we need the artists, we have to have the song, we have to have the performance, but without the recording engineer, nothing gets captured. And I'm very grateful that Lenise became a recording engineer. She's very talented. She's done amazing stuff. We've already been talking for a while, but I don't, I, I might skip a, a, ahead a little bit as I know a little bit from being your friend about some of your travels and you ended up going, you know, to the Caribbean, et cetera. But I want to get, while I have you, I want to get how did you end up working with Mike Chapman 
And how did you end up working in this building? I know we're skipping a lot, so we yeah. might do a part two. Mm -hmm. But I want, while I have you here, I want people to know that, you know, A, anyone can be in it. Girls, people, yeah. if you're interested, go for it. I had the opposite experience that you did when I started, or maybe you had this experience. When I started, my brother was teaching me, I never had any issues when I was an assistant engineer in the sense that I did not experience chauvinism and I really haven't in my career to be quite honest with you. It could be my personality, it could be whatever. I maybe because I grew up with brothers, didn't notice it. I feel very, very comfortable obviously in the That's a big difference. locker That's room a big environment difference. or whatever. Yeah. But I, I, no one messed with me as long as I could hold my own Mm -hmm. in the control room and do my yeah, you thing. you had to be good at what you did. Yeah, the, I know when, and people were very supportive. I found in general, you know, all the, a lot of people that we still know, a lot of those, those guys, they, they were just happy to have somebody who was into it. Well. You know what I mean? I have to um, give, go did, back to that Leon thing just yeah, a little bit sure, because yeah. there were some very important things that happened that uh, I know propelled me. Yeah. And one of them was that, uh, so I go to a recording school, 50 guys and me, and I haven't a clue what they're talking about. It's just lecture. I freak out going, I don't know what, um, you know, compression and velocity and amplitude and yeah, all no of these Ohm's things, law. Ohm's law and, yeah. and the Doppler effect and, and uh, you know, uh, all of these different things, compression and, and um, you know, limiting and EQ. equalization. And yeah. so after the first class, I'm sitting there and I'm just going, I am so screwed. I have no idea what they're talking about. I've dropped out of university. So I call Roger right after Good class move. Uh, yeah, and i'm just like oh my god i don't know what to blah 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 he goes come over nice so the next morning Mentor. since i'm not in university anymore it's tuesday um i go over to leon's house and roger goes okay this reduces is a, basics. A 1176 limiter and a limiter grabs those peaks and um so levels there's dynamics out. and so he showed me how that worked and this is what it sounds like with it in and this is what it sounds like with it out play with it a little bit boom and then and this is an la 2 a and there's um uh, there's compression there and what compression is is bottom and top and so it you know makes it a little punchier and this is what it sounds like blah 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 so talks me down talks me through and so monday and wednesday nights i went to class and Tuesdays and Thursdays, I, I could go over to Leon's house. Amazing. Yes, and practice what I had learned. And if I had any questions or anything, and God bless Roger. And Roger, sidebar, important sidebar, uh, was working on what he calls his little invention. And uh, this was Roger Lynn. The drum um, machine. Building. He made the Lynn drum, first drum yes. sampling machine. That's what he was working on already we didn't 18. say it was roger lynn this is all coming together now <laughs> that's why I, I wanted to yes you know, so i was uh not only was i going to a school where there wasn't brick and mortar so when we did have lab and hands-on it was at capitol amazing or it was at conway wow because uh there was no recording school with perfect equipment and you know, you know safety net do. or anything. I learned in real studios, whether it was in school or uh, at Leon's house. Yeah. And I got, and so Roger and Robert and um, Artwood, who was the first drum drummer on the first Lindrum. Oh, that's fun. Um, uh, he went on to play with Peter Frampton and Amazing. Gary Wright, and he uh, has his own post-production facility and great guy now awesome. uh, but art so artwood was in the band and um and so they would record and then i got to you know mix them and practice on their music and uh i think the name of the band was papa geppetto or something i don't i can't remember what but it this was. is so great because it's all hands-on it's yes. tying all the dots together and uh, because i was comfortable around guys yeah. because of my brothers and my dad and yeah. then my brother's friends that i have realized later in life how important that is and how there are many women who don't have good relationships with their father or stepfather or or other men they you know, have not been around them and things haven't i feel been more good. comfortable around men than i do women <laughs> 
I'm just that's just me. But I love you. Around you know, good I'm, people. I'm fine around yeah. both. But, but yeah, but you know, there are a lot of women who I realize and girls who didn't have that, and that that's a big deal. That's a bummer to come into an industry that's any industry that's male dominated, yeah. and and know how to behave. Yeah. And um, so I was comfortable with that. And so. Well, and it's cool because the guys that were showing you stuff, they treated you like an equal and they wanted you to learn. Well, because they realized how I was so myopic. Oh, my God. No, nobody was going to get in my way. I love it. I was just like, vroom. and that's a very guy thing. Yeah, you know? true. Yeah, but it Focus. was like, uh, and it was like, I don't need anybody to tell me no. I need them to tell me how. So good, if, good, if, good way if, to so be. If some somebody was saying, well, you know, and blah blah blah, and tried to mansplain something to me. I at any point in my life, and I still do this. I, I go, I already know how smart you are. You don't have to show me how smart you are. <laughs> I have this problem right now. I need to get this fixed. Get me on the air right now and give me get, an answer. Get, yeah, make this happen right now. And you know, I know you're smart. So, um, <laughs> well, it's important not to crush the sensitive male ego. Yeah. Well, it's, it's just like when, you know, you got to know how to cut to the chase, yeah, yeah. but most people I have found in my career, once they saw just how authentic I was Very about supportive. it, um, they wanted to help. Yeah. And, um, that's been my experience in general. And also I was hired at the village studios first by Gary Starr, who was the, is he um, still with us? I think he's, he's still with us. He's, he just moved back to New York last week and he's happy as a clam. Oh, I'm going to see him during. Um, I love him so yeah, much. Yeah, he's back to work. He's back to work. He's doing well. I love him so I'll much. I'll see him when at AES in he New was, York. He was, I might go. He was in residence at Encore when I worked at the old Kendon, when I worked at Red Zone and Take, or take yeah, One in yeah. Red Zone. He was down the street and Barney Perkins was there and he was the tech there and he had this great little dog. And we, yeah, that's skinny. And we would see each other every day because I walked down the block. Yeah. It's what yeah. I love and respect him so much. He is so smart and yes. he's such a dear friend. Love him. Uh, I took him to the airport. Oh, we love know, him. Yeah, we love you, Gary. Yeah, no, we're, we're Maybe one like of these the, days I'll get you. If you come out to California, I'll get you on the show. But he uh, he hired not only me, but three other women of, of the six assistants. Four were women. And I think one of the reasons why it worked so well was it had never been done. And people, there was no precedence. You know, these are all reflections now. Uh, at the time... It never occurred to me that women didn't do it. And I worked in a place where there were three other women. So it yeah. was like, I had no perspective on this. I just knew I had to be good at what I did. And we yeah. were all good at what we did. And Terry Becker Love her. was yes, there sir. first. And, and Barbara Isaac and I got hired on the same day. And so Terry um, had been there for two months. And so she told us how to mic, you know, no grab mic us. cables properly and get us. And I would assist her as an assistant to learn how to do it right, and we all eased in, but uh, every one of us, Carla Frederick was the other one, um, all did very well and went on to have Dude, successful the careers. Dude, and the sessions that you did at the Village, I mean, name some well, of the things. Well, timing, yeah, oh my God, it was, it was, was that Fleet, magic was, time. Was Fleetwood Mac around then with Ken Calais? Yeah. Was that during rumors? Well, that was at the end of my, I was an assistant for three years there, and my first day uh, I was put on to observe and assist an assistant was a tracking date with Alice Coltrane. Amazing. That was day one. I start with Alice Coltrane. And, um, you know, this wonderful date, and she's already a high priestess, and, and uh, I'm working with, um, you know, um, Baker Bigsby, and Ed Michelle was the producer, jazz producer. That's, I started that way. And then um, Dylan had done a lot of work at the village, and so when, you weren't on a session, they encouraged you to go up, up into the tape library and take out, oh, take, just take a reel out and go up in Studio C and, and practice and play around. And you'd just look and you'd see the band and you'd see Bob Dylan and you'd see, I mean, all of these amazing records, yep. Steely Dan records and yeah. uh, 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 reels of tape. And gee, I wonder which one I'll pick, you know? And, <laughs> and um, it was kind of overwhelming, you know, even then. Uh, but, but exciting. Um, we got a lot of encouragement to 
if the studio was down, you know, who was the manager then? Was uh, it Kathy Conner? Um, it, it was uh, Dick LaPalm. Okay. Uh, the jazz lobbyist. He'd been with Chess Records and Leonard Chess. Amazing. So he had been with Nat King Cole and, yeah. and Muddy Waters. And, Etta James. Yeah, and Etta ja definitely. Yeah. I got to work with Etta James. I'm a huge of, fan. Yeah, as an assistant. Also, uh, a major um, recordings were done there. And that was Still kind are. Of, well, <laughs> still are, yeah. yeah. And at the time, you see, uh, recording technology was such that it was, like I said, expensive and took up a lot of real estate and um, a home before, studio wasn't really a concert. No, there wasn't. There wasn't that. I mean, Leon was total exception to the rule. And so the people, the talent that came into studios had to prove that they were worth investing in to come into a studio where the record company yeah, the would spend, not gonna the, spend money. the money. Yeah. They had money, but they, so you didn't get any slouches, right. really, you know, Obviously, there's within that some are better than others, but it was always the caliber yeah. of talent Musicianship. And was yeah. was just tro the tops and the well, studio and vice was the versa. Top. You were expected to follow suit as yes. an engineer. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, the standards. Well, that was one also one of my goals because other people uh, in my class were happy to just like work with their friend's band or get in a little studio or something like that. And my whole goal the whole time, being that myopic person, was to work in the best studio with the best engineers and the best producer on the yeah. best music with the best equipment. Kind of in my attitude. Yeah, and I, uh, yes, it took me longer than a lot of my colleagues to, um, you know, become an independent engineer working for Mike Chapman. Uh, I was working, two of the, big records I worked on. One, I worked on 10 and a half months. That was Steely Dan's Asia album. Great and then Breakfast in America for seven and a half months. And we, we, we know that there was, was there some romance with working with Breakfast in America, with working with Sue for Tramp? Later. Okay. Later. All right. Well, Afterwards. We go, we go, okay. I was very, That'll be in part two. <laughs> well, yeah. But, um, <laughs> and I don't really talk about it that much because okay. um, now I'm okay to talk about it and I will. Yeah, but we can do that um, later. But during that time, I knew as there was just an awareness. It, it wasn't yeah, you would being, be judged. Well, you'd be judged where guys wouldn't get judged. All a girl had to do, yeah, um, to lose your integrity and your credibility. Credibility was to sleep with the club. To, yeah, to fraternize. You know, so, soil the pan. <laughs> we'll say eat out of. We'll say fraternize. Yeah, nice yeah, word, and yeah. you know, I knew. No matter how I felt about anybody, whether I was, you know, I was uh, with Robert Fleischman for a lot of that. Um, and then we broke up and we got back together. And so I was single for part of it. But I knew the last thing I was going to do was get him date, date anybody I worked with because that would just that would ruin it for me. My rule was they had to be the record had to be done. Like they had to be done and no longer a client. But I really, I was always married. So I didn't really, well, yeah. I didn't really get too tempted, you know, and, and, and as a manager, I'm not in the room with them every day. Like you are as an engineer. I mean, when you're working in a close environment, people wonder like how actors end up together. Well, come on, you're in a well, room together 12 hours a day and, and you get to very know people. very intimate, creative. Very creative. You're, you're making a baby. Yeah. And it's yeah. the same energy. It's in the just, best way possible. In, that, um, that intimacy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, uh, it's not a bad thing. It, it's not, not a, at all. It's a good thing. And it, I call them artist crush. You get yeah. an artist crush. I had a crush on Chris Cornell. That was yeah. my bad but, crush. Uh, <laughs> but also, it's a, out of a lot of respect. Yeah. And um, so, uh, but I knew never to mess around like that. And uh, and I wanted to go back that, yes, I did have challenges uh, with some artists a little bit being a woman because I wouldn't sleep with anybody. So immediately, I'm gay. Yeah, and they called me the dyke. Oh, that's weird. They called me the dyke. I because can't see that. How could you resist me? Oh, I don't. You I know, couldn't see that. Well, the, that's no, this weird. was way back in the seventies. You know, I yeah. am so fabulous. The only way you could possibly resist me is you must be gay. I think I got out of it because I was always married. Well, and um, I also, I was actually 
making a living modeling for this French You're good looking now, Lenise. And that's, well, that's how I paid for engineering school, and that's how I afforded to become, to be an assistant yeah. at the village, because back then you didn't get paid anything yeah. as an assistant. Yeah. Uh, so on weekends, the store that I used to work at in the Hollywood Riviera down at uh, Redondo Beach, they... Um, had all these French clothes and all, and I did all their flyers for them, and they would pay me in, clothes. in, in designer clothes. Beautiful. But, uh, yeah, so what a great I had gig. great, wonderful clothes. And Terry Becker did too, and so we'd notice the, the French jeans and the, you know, the... Chemin de fur. Yeah, oh, well, the, well, even, you know, more than that. High but, class. Uh, you know, uh, um, but when I worked, uh, I wore my glasses, I didn't wear makeup. I wore my Westlake Audio T-shirt, and you so, played it. You downplayed it. Well, I did, I wanted them to. I did not want to play the girl card. Yeah. And I knew it, it was very easy to play that girl card. Yeah. Uh, but I did not want that. I wanted to be an engineer that happened to be a girl, you know. And so th because I wasn't um, uh, flirty. <laughs> I wasn't going into, you know, sub, uh, I wasn't uh, falling for their, you know. Charm. Their charms, thank you. <laughs> See, I can't even come up with it because it wasn't that charming. But, um, and Barbara Isaac was uh, very developed and she would wear her uh, Daughters of the American Revolution t-shirt or whatever and she was, she was an activist person. Um, but she, you know, Good was well endowed, and so they would call us boobs in the dike. Well, that's get not boobs cool. in the dike in here. Well, that's not cool. I'm, so, I'm sad such to a hear shock. that. Well, and back then, I, uh, I wasn't really aware of, of um, homosexuality or or anything like that. I was again just wanting to be an engineer and did not know girls didn't do this or whatever and it's kind of um, the opposite of my so, experience so I didn't have any of that. but that didn't last long and that wasn't with very many people and Good. those were not i found the the higher quality um musicianship and the uh, integrity of the people Really, you know, after they first got over the shock of the assistant being a girl, it mm -hmm. took them like two seconds. Once I said, well, you know, hi, I'm Lenny Spent, and I'll be assisting you on this on your session. They go, oh, whoa. You know, first they go, um, oh, good. You know, you know, girl candy. And it'd be like, no, no, I'm, I'm aligning your two track. Nice. And now I'm going to be setting up. But thanks. You know, and you'd play it. You'd be easy with it, but you'd let them know. And they'd get over it really fast. Nice. And... And all you had to do was demonstrate ability, your ability, and and you're a team player, and you're there for them, Dave. And you were doing your job that they needed you to do. Uh, the girl thing went away pretty fast. Yeah, if you're listening to this, don't let it stop you. Yeah, and <laughs> and also they said, you know, it's kind of nice not having you know 100% testosterone in well, here. You know, you know what I say, and you're going to crack up. So I, I've got a girl on staff now. And whenever, and you've heard me say this, whenever I do a panel, or Paul and I would do a panel at a school or something, I would say, look, don't let anything stop you. And I said, and the yeah. fact, the fact that they get to turn around and you're pretty and you smell good is just a bonus. I said, just make sure you know what you're doing and that you stick with the plan. I mean, I had the opposite experience that you did, but well, everybody was supportive, but I did, also I worked for my brother and he was a hard ass. I love you, Steve, but you were tough. But what happened was I stopped engineering because I thought I didn't, hadn't gone to school and I didn't think I would ever be able to grasp the electronics aptitude that I thought I needed to be really, really good. And, but my brother had the studio and I wanted to help him and I had been a bartender and worked in hotels and catering in the hospitality you know, sphere in college. And I said, look, I'd done that, a session with Shell Tommy. He's blind. He's an amazing engineer. He was super nice. He was fine. Everybody was cool. But after that session, I thought, oh my God, this guy's blind and he's freaking amazing. And I had enough of an ego that I'm like, I'm never going to be that amazing. And if I can't be amazing, I don't want to do it. So I said to my brother, I'd like to help you book it. 
And that's how I transitioned. Mm -hmm. Sorry, mm -hmm. hitting the microphone. That's how I transitioned and ended up doing what I now do, which I love, and I'm very happy with that. With well, that and you're, change, um, you know, a maestro. Oh, uh, dude, thanks. You, know, you, and, you as well. Um, uh, you know that there are very few. It's a, such an exquisite, exclusive club. You, know, <laughs> you, you Roseman. Um, yeah, all Paula, the managers are women, um, almost yeah, all of them. There's so many that, um, you know, Zoe, um, for all. Uh, but so I, I did, I just wanted to let yeah. you know and let the people listening know that I didn't default to being a manager because it was accepted to be a woman in that role. I did it because I wanted to do it. Well, I didn't it, even think about it. I, well, I didn't and, know at the time that the managers were all women. It didn't, I did, well, but and it they didn't, aren't all women. It and, didn't compute. I mean, it, yeah, there are plenty of male it, managers too. Well, but, you're, it takes a very special person to come off as easygoing and fun and all of that, yet I knew the first time you and I had lunch at Columbia, I said, this woman's smart as a fox. Oh, well, thank you. You know, and we, we were just talking about like this, and I went, I... I know who well, this thank is. thank you. Immediately. <laughs> thank I, you. Well, you got to collect the money. I appreciated you. Well, <laughs> you yes, got to get the money. Well, but you make people feel comfortable and you make things seem like everything's going smoothly and you can, you know. Don't I've, look behind the curtain. I have, right? seen, <laughs> I have appreciated from afar events that are social out here when suddenly a 60 piece orchestra got moved here and we need six more headphones yeah. and you know somebody's in there soldering or you, yeah. you know and you know you make it nobody happen. out there knew what was going down in same here same for you though you make it happen you, well you know that's you're, what you you're do. there you, to facilitate the music and facilitate the and art and yeah you and, and do you, such amazing you job. inspire and 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 I inspire and capture. That's that's my that's your job. My uh, approach to uh, engineering and producing. I you know I produce artists now. Steven, too. I could talk to you forever, but I think we're going to have to do a part two because we've already had an hour and a half. Oh my god! <laughs> All right. Well, let's uh, do a part two then? because yeah, we okay. haven't even got. Then we haven't even scratched the surface. So yeah, I say this. It's a teaser. There's going to be a part two. And we're going to get to all this. And you're not, don't feel bad. You're not the only one. Like Chickarelli yeah. and oh, I'm sure. most people. And, and people, if you have the patience to watch these episodes all the way through, God bless you because I, hopefully you'll be rewarded. And the point being, which I always say, is we're shining a light. There's no one way to get your perfect job. The journey that gets you there is different for everyone. But yes. a lot of the things that people talk about there's a lot of common denominators that come out in these talks that had never occurred to me, which is the obvious, stick to it, love music, honor music, learn how to be the very best you can be by capturing music, keep up on your game, your ears, listen. protect your ears, be listen. Be a good listener. Be a good listener. But so many things, but we're going to do a part two because there's we haven't even scratched the surface of what Lanise has done and what she's still doing. <laughs> What she's still That's doing. Right. So we're gonna we're gonna cap it here. Again, you gotta check out two. Okay, because we're gonna have a second episode. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't want them to be so long no. that people that people will lose interest. So part two is coming. Yes. All right. I love you so much. You're um, so fucking interesting. Likewise, thank you're you. You're so, so much. fascinating. You um, know, you're so freaking smart. You're so <laughs> kind. You're gorgeous, oh. Oh. you know, all these things that make you fabulous you. And I just want to thank you so much for being here. And girls, oh, man. be engineers. Come on, we need more. Yes, just, yeah. you know, everybody can do it who wants to. That's right. Just know that. My parents told me I could be an astronaut. I fell short, obviously. <laughs> but I love what I do. So, yes. yeah, we're going to talk about it. There'll be a part two. Thank you, Nader. Thank you, Thank Keith. You Thank you so guys. much. Oh. I can't wait. Thank you for Trade Secrets, uh, Candace, your host. Thank you, Lenise, for being on today. Lenise, we love her. Yep. That's All it. Right.